Hey guys, welcome back. Justin here with Deep Dive Stocks. Today we're going to be continuing our lecture series on VOEX, and today we're going to be looking at snap graphs. So let's get started. So sometimes VOEX can be a little bit more art than science, and snap graphs were designed to really pull VOEX down to earth, uh, ground it in statistical you know, verification, and kind of try to remove some of the art aspect to interpreting VOEX when necessary. So we're going to cover a few goals today, but ultimately we're going to see that uh, the snap graphs are pretty straightforward and uh, are pretty insightful and powerful, I think. So we're going to talk about what the goals for developing the snap graphs were. Then we're going to go into the research behind them and what the results of the research research were. Um, we're going to talk about the components of the snap graph. Thankfully, there's only like four of them. And then we're just going to briefly look at an example where we're going to look at a uh, the snap graphs of a stock over the course of a month and see how well the snap graphs did. So. The, so the goals of the snap graphs were to quantify Vorex's behavior and kind of remove a little bit of that uncertainty when looking at Vorex and going, I don't, is this Vorex behavior spikish or is this normal Vorex behavior? Sometimes some of those more interpretive uh, ways that Vorex can present, themse present itself. And so we wanted to be able to quantify that and give actionable and predictive price action from those Vorex behaviors. We also, the snap graphs need it to be easy to interpret. I didn't want anything to be too complex. Uh, and we're gonna see that I think the snap graphs did do that pretty well. We also wanted it to be statistically relevant, right? So, you know, there's no point in looking at a metric if it's not gonna give us actionable data. And with that statistical relevancy, we want it to be, to have some actionable insights. So those were the goals or the motivations for producing the snap graphs. The one thing to keep in mind is that the snap graphs are optimized for uh, like the direction of price movement. And one of the ways that that was achieved is by using a modified running average. Um, so this is a complex looking equation, but it's really not. Basically, most running averages are done by like, all right, what was the change in price from day one to day two? And then what was the change in price from day two to day three? And then we average up all of those. What the, how the snap graphs interpret price action is it goes from the first day to the second day and then the first day to the third day and then the first day to the fourth day, so on and so forth. And then the, uh, those values are average. And it gives a better view of the path of the price action versus just like the starting and ending points, which may, you may lose some data if you um, just kind of use those. The when in looking for the data throughout the market we looked uh the research was done over a span of uh three years and a dynamic selection kind of like a bootstrap selection was used to verify the snap graphs and what that means is 200 randomly chosen stocks for each of those stocks 100 randomly chosen days and then a 20 by 4 matrix of models were um, computed so the idea being that i wanted to ensure you know how far back did we need to capture Vox behavior and then how far forward would that be statistically relevant and so we since the snap graphs i always knew i wanted like a one month two week one week and one day so that's the four in the uh, column and then the 20 was basically day you know capturing Vox's behavior from day one to day 20 and some combinations of those in between and then the model was calculated and then we went from, you know, if it was like day one uh, or like a one day prediction, we would go to the next day. Was it positive? Was it negative? Because remember, the snap graphs are just optimized for positive or negativeness, not necessarily for the magnitude of the price uh, action. And then, of course, if it was positive and the prediction was positive, it was counted as a correct uh, result. All in all, 2.4 million data points were collected, which isn't bad. It's not. It's a decent data set. And it turns out the snap graphs do actually have some pretty good predictive powers uh, thanks to Vorex, right? That's what they're based off of. So the 20 day snap was about 78, not about, but it was 78% correct. And that's 20 trading days, right? So that's one month. The 10 trading days or the two weeks was 75% uh, correct. 
the five days or five trading days, so the one week was 76% correct. And then the one day or the one trading day was 68% correct. And that's kind of what you like to see, right? So the one day snap grabs are overall less correct. I mean, still quite uh, well above 50% or chance, right? So it already beats almost all of the traditional metrics in the market. But the but the long, more long-term, more conservative 20-day snaps are, are 78% correct. So it's pretty often that you'll see like the one-day snaps are very reactive to um, like changing environments. And sometimes they can give some false positives. Whereas the one month snap or the, you know, the 20 trading day snap is pretty conservative. Um, and that lends itself to being overall more correct, but at times it can be less or a little too slow in adapting to uh, drastically changing environments. But overall, some great predictive powers here with snap graphs, if I do say so myself. So what are the components of these snap graphs? Well, there's really only one, there's two that we need to know, and that's the crosshairs, right? So this crosshair is right here, and right in the middle is where the model's current prediction is saying the, uh, the future price action will be. And that's in relation to this gold line. So if the crosshairs are above the gold line, then it's a positive prediction. If the crosshairs are below the gold line, then it's a negative prediction. And that's how you read the snap graphs. The other components of the snap graphs I kept in, just so you can get a, um, if you're using the snap graphs, you can get a better understanding of how well the snap algorithm is capturing the Vorex behavior. And the first thing to do to kind of look at if you're curious about that is the trend line. So that's that little squiggly guy right here. That shows the trend in the association between Vorex and the price action. So for instance, we see that as the snap uh, number, we could just say Vorex, as Vorex becomes more positive over this time frame, you know, the, it becomes more likely that positive predictions will be, uh, will be seen. But if Vorex moves up too much, too quickly, then we start getting diminishing returns. And it actually looks like uh, over in this right tail event, we can get some negative returns if Vorex moves up too quickly. With that, though, is the highlighted region. The highlighted region is the 95% confidence interval. And it just helps uh, really verify that the trend that we're looking at, and by extension, the crosshairs, are um, statistically relevant. It's also good to know, since the snap graphs are uh, optimized for price action, not necessarily the magnitude of the price movement, instances like this, where over on this left side, we have a highlighted region or the 95% confidence interval is both in the positive and the negative quadrants. That gives us a little bit of pause, a little uh, food for thought. If our model was telling us, if our model was sitting right here, right? And then finally, we have the individual data points colored after Vorex, since Vorex is the, the meat and potatoes of the SNAP algorithm. And the reason for keeping the points in is, you know, it can help us understand how well the model is capturing Vorex's behavior. For instance, in this left tail, tail event here, we see that the Vorex, for the same value of Vorex, there is both positive and negative predictions, or positive and negative price action that's correlated which is probably the reason why this highlighted or the highlighted region or the 95% confidence interval is so wide over here. And now we know exactly why. So this Vorex behavior, if our model was over here, is telling us that, well, there's a pretty wide distribution of price return that we can expect here. But ultimately the snap graphs really come down to is the crosshair above or below the golden line. So now let's just look at an example. So we're gonna be looking at Apple real uh, looking, so this is from March 3rd, the closing price was uh, $166.23. And we see that on the one month or the 20 trading day, we have a positive prediction because the crosshair is above the gold line. For the 10 trading day or the two weeks, we again have a positive prediction because the crosshairs are above the gold line. The five day or the one week is saying probably negative returns, but the one day is saying positive returns because again, the crosshair is above the gold line. And just to be sure, we're not going to do this on everyone, but here we see that the trend line is pretty well established. And the 95% confidence interval throughout is pretty well confined to either the positive or the negative quadrant. So there's not many places where the 95% confidence interval moves over into the positive or negative quadrants. So overall, we can have some pretty good confidence in this model. Moving forward a week, on March 10th, we had a closing price of $158.52. 
And now we see that again on the one month, the 20 trading day, we have positive predictions, negative predictions on the two week, negative predictions on the one week, and negative predictions on the one day. Moving again forward a week, and we're going to go over the results once we move through the month. We see that we have positive predictions again on the one month, positive predictions again on the two week, negative predictions again on the one week, and this time positive predictions on the one day. And notice how quickly we can tell that, right? We literally just look for the crosshairs and see where they are in relation to the gold mine. And the 17th ended with a closing price of $160.62. Moving forward yet another week, on the 24th of March, with a closing price of $174.07, we see this time now that the prediction for the one month is very up, right? It's very into the positive quadrant. Same with the two week, same with the one week, and same with the one day. So as of March 24th, we have positive predictions on all four time frames per snap graph. And moving right along, finally, on March 31st, we have a closing price of 174, and we have positive predictions on the one month, positive predictions on the two week, negative predictions on the one week, and negative predictions on the one day. So let's look, how did Snap do throughout this whole month? Well, on the third, we said that the one month prediction was positive and this ended up being correct. So from the third to the 31st, we had a change in price of 166.23 to 174.19. So indeed positive change. The two week was a positive prediction, but that was incorrect, unfortunately, unfortunately just so. So the, the price ended at 160.52 for a negative return, not positive. The one week was a negative return and that was correct with a change in price from 166 to 158. The one day was a positive prediction. This was incorrect. It went from 166 to 163.17 the next day. Unfortunate. The 10th, the two week return was negative. This was incorrect. It went from 158 to 174. The one week was negative. This was also incor incorrect. It went from 158 to 160. And the 10th or the 10, uh, the one trading, the one day anticipation uh, on the 10th was negative. This ended up being correct with a change from 158 to 154. This is a pretty good indication of like the benefit that that one day gives us. Although it's like not as predictive overall, the 10th seems when we move through the data, we're gonna see that the 10th for Apple was a pretty dynamic time. And the one day snap graph was really the only one that was able to catch that um, dynamicism, right? Moving to the 17th, we said that the two week was a positive prediction. This was correct. So it went from 160 to 174 on the 31st. The one week was positive. This was also correct. So it went from 160 to 174.07 on the 24th. And then the 17th one day's prediction was positive. This was also correct. It went from 160 to 163 on the 18th. Moving on, the 24th, the one week prediction was uh, positive. This was correct by just so, right? Some like 54 cents. The one day or the one day prediction was positive. This was also correct. 174.07 to 174.72. Lots of sevens here. And finally, on the 31st, we had a negative prediction on the one day snap graph. And on the 1st of April, the price did indeed end negative at 174.20. So overall, for Apple throughout the month of March, we had a 69.23% correctness in terms of the price action, uh, if it was positive or negative, uh, with respect to the snap graphs. Not too shabby, right? So. That's the snap graphs in sum. Uh, thank you for joining me. I hope you guys uh, liked it. I hope you find the snap graphs useful. If you like this and other Vorex related data, as well as the data dives that I put up on my channel, please like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you guys around. Happy trading. Bye.